Welcome to Grace Community Chapel. Thank you. Super happy to see you. I'm super happy that people online can see me. I don't know if they're happy about that, but here I am. Whew, man. I see a lot of like faces I haven't seen in a long time, and that's really cool. Um, so thank you for being here. I, I am very excited to be here. I've got a few announcements. Um, other people have announcements. It's going to be an announce full day. I just made that word up. I watched last week's announcements. This is the first time I've ever done this. <laughs> because somebody told me, it's actually my wife, that I said happy birthday instead of happy Mother's Day to my mom. And I, and I did. There's video evidence of it. And, and also, can I just say, it's a terrifying experience to watch yourself online or anywhere. Um, so I apologize for everything in advance. Anyway, um, yes, exactly. Yes. <laughs> okay. Exactly. Blanket apology. <clears throat> Except for the, for the puns. Those were good. I'm not apologizing for those. Okay. Why don't we pray? And then I'll keep going here. <laughs> Heavenly Father, I thank you for the day we have here today. I, I just thank you again for the weather that we have, the nice warm sunshine we can enjoy, and and more importantly, um, just the time here this morning to worship you and to focus on you and um, to give you so much attention. We thank you for that opportunity and thank you that, that you want that from us, Lord. It's, it's an amazing thing. Um, we love you. We pray for your blessing on this service and we thank you so much for loving us. We pray this in your name. Amen. All right, so announcements. I'm going to have, uh, Bruce has an announcement. I didn't tell him when he's coming up, but it's right now. So <laughs> spur of the moment. He said it's a Cheryl-like announcement, so I feel like I should take a nap. I don't know how much it's like Cheryl, but actually it's more like Rick. Remember back a month or two ago when Rick spoke and he had the glue up here and the different kinds of glue? Well, you know, um, well, Ben, maybe I could use you here, Ben, if you could. Some of these things are going to... This isn't The Price is Right, but if you can guess the price is, then we will, you know... Sorry, Marion, but I'll take Carol Merrill over him. <laughs> um, back a month or so ago, we announced the uh, Hannaford Help Schools that can help the scholarship fund here at Grace Christian Academy. And that program is almost over. It's got like two more weeks to run. So I thought I would do an advertisement for it to encourage you to go buy some stuff and uh, help out the school with the scholarship program. These are all things that we enjoy, we eat, and pretty inexpensive, and it will help the school. Starting from 69 cents for raisins, peanut butter, $1.89. Hannah, for, I should get a cut for this. <laughs> Baked beans for $1.79 or $2.29 for brownies. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, well, go, go to Hannaford, go to your local Hannaford, you buy four of these brownie bo boxes, and you get $3 for the school scholarship fund that you can either bring back here and put in one of the boxes on either end of the building, or if it's the Gardner Hannaford, you can put it in the Grace Christian Academy slot that's right by the door as you go out. So, and make sure if you buy four of these, any four items, make sure you get the coupon because sometimes the thing doesn't work right, the printer doesn't work right, and it won't print you one. So hang on until you get your $3 coupon. They've got extras there in the office, and you, at least in Gardner, so you can get those. So all kinds of good stuff, graham crackers, uh, fruit snacks, you can get four of those for $2.80 and get a $3 coupon to help out the scholarship program at Grace Christian Academy. So your kids will love you for it. Raisins, you know, a good snack, healthy snack, and all that kind of stuff. So um, check it out. And like I said, we've got, I think it's the 29th. Yes, Ruth? Yes. On, yeah, you go to Hanford online. You can find a list of everything. I mean, there's hundreds and hundreds of items on there. And um, like I said, I think, I think it's two weeks from yesterday I have to turn them into Hannaford. So you've got just about two weeks to uh, go do your grocery shopping and help out Grace Christian Academy and the scholarship fund. So thank you.
I just had this idea while you were talking. Like, there's some people that may be like, I just got groceries. I don't think I'll eat all that food. Um, you could buy food that you don't need, and you could donate it to the Chrysalis Place in Gardner if that was something that works for you. Um, exactly. But that way, you would be helping two things at once, which seems really cool, right? So yeah, the Chrysalis Place is a food bank in Gardner. We've, we've dropped stuff. Last year, we did a food drive for them and dropped it off there. You just go to their, their um, facility. This was pre-COVID, so maybe not go there. I don't know. Um, you can call them and say, I have some food to donate, and they can give you instructions on how to do that. Um, so just something to throw out there. If you have too much food and don't want more, buy it for somebody else. Sound good? Cool. OK, so other announcements we have. <clears throat> Summer VBS is going to be August 2nd through the 6th um, here at the church. And it's going to be from 9 to 11.30 in the morning. Um, we tried to push for 9 to 5, but somebody doesn't want to do that. So <clears throat> um, it's fine. It's fine. Um, ages 5 to 12, that's going to be the age group you can go through. Um, and if you have more questions on that, you can see uh, Brenda. Or who? What? Or Megan, um, any of those, you know, people. And <laughs> um, yeah, so they're still looking for some volunteers, maybe. You can talk to them about that. Um, the theme looks like it's going to be Mystery Island, which sounds mysterious <laughs> at the very least, and exciting. So we're excited about that this summer of uh, VBS. We haven't done a VBS in a long time or ever, I don't, not since I've been here. Um, so this is an exciting thing to have happen here. I um, wanted to say thank you for everybody that came out to the work day yesterday. It was a, a success. Work was done. And um, we always appreciate people coming out for that. It's an awesome way to serve and to be connected to the church. Let's see. I wrote all of them down today because people were harassing me last week about not writing it down. Yes. <laughs> um, I think that was all except for, I am throwing together, um, so actually, back up a little bit. Um, yesterday, I, I mentioned last week, we had a board meeting at Camp Berea yesterday um, to discuss summer plans of how camp is going to work, if camp's going to work this summer, and turns out it is. Um, so Camp Berea is all set up for the summer. So it will be like a normal overnight camp um, with you know some regular, not regulations, like precautions taken and everything, um, but keep that in your prayers. We're looking for staff still, um, looking for uh, just a lot of work to be done to get camp ready. You take a year off from camp and, and you know, there is an army of squirrels that live out there that do <laughs> bad things to the building, um, and it's terrifying. Like, like, if you've lived through it, it's not, not, it's not good. Anyway, <laughs> I might need counseling. I lived there for two years or more than that in the apartment upstairs, and you basically share that space with the squirrels. Um, they ate my peanut butter cups off the floor once in my apartment. Anyway, so anyway, that's a rabbit trail or a squirrel trail. Um, <clears throat> anyway, so there's a lot of work to be done. So a Cambria is a missionary that we support as a church. We send um, financial support to them every month. Um, which is critically important now because I looked at the finances yesterday um, <laughs> and missing a year of camp is, is not good for finances. But anyway, June 19th, um, I am putting together a short-term missions trip to Camp Berea. Um, and so I'm looking for volunteers from our church to go with me. So we have some projects to do to get camp ready for the summer. And uh, one of those is redoing a small roof, stripping shingles off, and putting new roofing down. So I'm going to need a few people for that. That's the big, big one. But um, if you're like, I don't do roofing, I don't do heights, there is so much other stuff to do that you can like wash windows or sweep floors or, or there's uh, trees to cut, things like that. Hmm? Yes. Well, there's not a lot of acorns. Pine cones are prevalent. Yeah. So th there's a lot of those. Um, I actually ran a retreat once where I, I played a game of the camper that could pick up the most pine cones won, and it was awesome. Uh, get done really quick. You can make anything into a game. So anyway, um, there'll be more details coming on that, but June 19th, um, we're going to do a work day out there, um, and I'm excited for it, and if you want to join in the work out there and see exactly what camp is and what it's all about, um, come check it out. It's going to be fun. It's a very old building. It needs a lot of work. So 
I think that's all of my announcements. Mr. Jeremy has one. Oh wait, no, while you're coming up here, I'm just gonna read this. This is an announcement from Cheryl. Um, so <laughs> I'm expecting it to keep folding down, but it doesn't. <laughs> Anyone interested in Operation Christmas Child, uh, next Saturday, the 22nd, there's a virtual conference here at the church, 9.30 to 2 p.m., um, 9.30 to 10.30, regular meeting. I don't know what that means. Oh, there's a regular meeting. There. there will be a meeting, worship, and encouragement. Come see what the Lord is doing and how you can be a part of it through giving a, a shoebox gift. Or as a volunteer, if interested, please contact Cheryl Shank. Um, I think this is... I can't read this part. But, yeah, contact Cheryl. Okay? There's no cost. It's free. All right, Jeremy's got something now. Thanks, Ben. Appreciate it. All right, so um, I made an announcement last week, uh, and I'm going to have to kind of like the governor go back and say, change my mind. Um, so <laughs> we are looking at um, the most recent coming out from the CDC um, and all of that, uh, and so it is you know, pretty much at that stage at the 24th, uh, which would be a Monday. Uh, the governor has said that all restrictions on the mask wearing would be removed, uh, so both internally and outside. So um, we will follow, as we have been, the recommendations and the law. Um, and so as of, 24, as of the 24th, you will not be required to wear a mask coming into church. Okay. All right. But until the 24th, we ask that you continue to maintain that, okay? So we, we recognize that we're doing it to follow the law. We're trying to do that uh, to be true to what Romans 13 says, to be true to what 1 Peter says. That's why we're doing it. Um, that being said, um, we also want to be keeping in mind that just because the law has changed, that people might still have concerns. There might still be people who have some safety concerns. There might be people who are like, you know what, I can't get the vaccine or I don't really prefer to get the vaccine. And so we're, we're going to have to be conscious of the people in our body and maybe what they feel most comfortable with. So if you still want to wear a mask, we're not telling you you can't wear them. Okay, this isn't like, okay, now that's the 24th, you can't wear a mask anymore. No, that, that's, not, that's not how this works. Uh, and we would ask that you be mindful of the people around you uh, don't just rush up, give them a hug and a big kiss on the cheek like you used to do. Um, but like, be, be thinking about it and be asking them what their preference is, right? So let's, let's be conscious of other people. Let's be, be mindful of who we have in our body uh, and, and not be violating their conscience in some way. So that note aside. Uh, also have a note uh, about Jim Brand. He is back home. Uh, so yes. So continue to pray for him, continue to pray for, for both of them, and um, you know, feel free to reach out and just connect for some encouragement. Um, and uh, if there's anything else that we can be doing as a church, we'll be letting you know. Um, but uh, he is home, he's home from the hospital, so that's, a, that's really good news. So that's all I have for announcements. Oh, yes, bright light. The mandate, as it is, is given, does not give any sort of indication on vaccinated versus not vaccinated. Um, so the other thing is, is that we've said this from the beginning, we are not a police force here, and we're not going to go around asking every person, are you vaccinated? Are you vaccinated? We're not going to do that. Uh, so we're going to put it back on you to do what you think is right in the Christian conscience. Um, and we're going to follow the recommendations of, of the government, which was, or the law of the government, uh, the CDC would still recommend that if you have not been vaccinated that you would wear a mask, but that's a recommendation, not a requirement. And so we're not going to, we're not going to get into a, a I'm, not, I'm not a virologist, okay, I'm not a doctor, it's not what I do. Um, so listen to your health providers, let's, let's manage it as an assembly, but that's a good question. Any other questions or thoughts on that? It's not really a family meeting, but I'm willing to entertain questions. Okay, all right. With that, I'll give it back to you. He's more enjoyable anyways. <laughs> I have to say, Jeremy, I, like, I don't know about everybody else, but I've only kissed one person in this church ever, and that was my wife on our wedding day. Um, <clears throat> right here. No, not since then, never, yeah. You don't do that, right? It may have, I don't know. 
<laughs> Let me check my tally. <laughs> Just kidding. Anyway. I like having fun with you guys. If, if, if you know, I don't want to be boring up here. It's not a good way to start. Anyway, so we have the scripture reading now. And I wrote that down and I completely lost the paper. I think Jeremy stole it from me. <laughs> it's in behind me, isn't it? Yes, John 11, 38 through 44. Is that 33 or 38? I can't tell. He told me 38. I've completely forgot where John is in my Bible. There it is. All right. It does say 33. I wrote down 38. I highlighted 38. Anyway, it's not a big deal. <laughs> so I'm reading out of the uh, English Standard Version today because um, I like the way it reads as a story. Whew. Okay, I guess I'll start in verse 33 because it's up there. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him? But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? And then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead for four days. And Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the man who had died came out, his hands and his feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. And may the Lord bless the reading of his word. And the worship team can come on up. Good morning. Good morning. Would you all rise with us as we prepare to worship? Let's pray before we get started. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day that you've given to us. We thankful. We are thankful for your grace and your mercy. Father, we pray that you would stir our hearts this morning, that you would prepare us for the word that is to come, that we would leave here different than when we came. We ask this in the name of our Lord and our Savior, your Son, Jesus Christ. And it is in his name that we pray. Amen. I jumped the gun, sorry. <laughs> there we go. There we are. <laughs>
seated. You know what's crazy is I walked all the way up here and I didn't bring my notes. So we have a question. Do you want me just to preach without the notes or with the notes? <laughs> no, I'm going to grab my notes. <laughs> but I'm young enough, I'll just leap off the platform. How about that? Okay, now I have my notes. It's only one page, but it makes a difference. Magnify the Lord with me. I, you know, when we sing songs together, we're, God has angels that are doing the job of constantly magnifying the Lord at the throne, right? He, day and night, never ceasing. What's awesome is when his people get together and magnify the Lord together. That's cool. All right, we're in John 11. Let's pray first before we get started. Father God, we come here this morning as broken people. And Father, we have many needs, many things on our minds, the emotions of the week. For some people, God, this was a really hard week. And for other people, it's been a really hard year. And God, we pray that you would be with each person here this morning, both in person and those who are online. And Father, I pray that you would uh, bless them this morning, give them the time and, and the ability to just sit and listen to your word and what your son has done while he was here on earth. And we look forward to the things that are yet to come. We ask these things in your son's name. Amen. All right, John chapter 11. Uh, and we've been in John for a while now. Um, it's been since like September, I think, uh, that we started in John. Um, we, we had kind of hoped that maybe we would get to the whole crucifixion and resurrection by the time Easter hit, and we just couldn't do that. <laughs> so, John 11, um, and I just want to reiterate, Dana did an amazing job last week, and I've been thinking about just so many of the things that he said last week, all week, um, and I just uh, appreciate his ministry. Um, so we're going to be starting in verse 27, um, because Dana had left his message last week with a question, and that was the question that was seen in verse 26. Um, I should say 25 and 26, and that's where Jesus said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives, believes in me, shall never die. And Jesus asked the question, do you believe this? And, and Dana kind of left us with the challenge of, well, do you? And that's, that's an important thing, right? Do you believe this? So a uh, little bit of backup, if you weren't with us last week. Um, so story basically goes that Jesus is out. He's, he's just gotten into some trouble with the Jews. And so he leaves and he goes away for a little while. And, and uh, he, he's, he's out teaching some of the disciples. And all of a sudden, a good friend, a certain man named Lazarus, becomes ill. And uh, Lazarus was a good friend of Jesus. And so Mary and Martha send messengers on uh, to Jesus to say, hey, Lazarus isn't well, um, come see him. And Jesus waits around, and Dana talked about that last week. And Jesus says, it's not my time to go yet, we're going to wait. And then finally Jesus says, okay, now it's time to go, we're going to go. And, you know, Thomas says, you know, oh yeah, let's go die with him. You know, real, real encouraging. <laughs> it's not an encourager. <laughs> so we get into where we are, and Jesus has this moment with Martha when he shows up. And the reason why it's important to do the backdrop is because Jesus has a moment with Martha, and he has kind of an interaction, personal interaction with her, and then she goes and gets Mary, and then Jesus is going to have an interaction with Mary. 
And it's interesting how we have like the, the, Mar the Mary scene and we have the Martha scene and how Jesus interacts with both of them. So in verse 28, we're just concluding that, that statement that Martha made, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who is coming into the world, verse 27. In verse 28, we have, we have what begins Mary's scene. Which says, when she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, the teacher is here and is calling for you. Verse 29, when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. So let's, go, let's give a little backdrop. So Jesus obviously comes into the city, but he doesn't come all the way into the village. He's kind of on the outside. Meets with Martha. Martha meets him. She goes back and talks to Mary. It's interesting, the text says privately. So like she kind of like pulls her aside. And you have to understand, there's a big commotion going on in the house right now. So in Jewish tradition, what they would do is they would have mourners come. Uh, from the point of death for about... 30 days, especially a huge amount in the first seven. And they would actually hire people to cry. Right, it's, it's funny, like, that's their tradition. They would hire people to come and cry, and they would follow the members of the family around, and they would weep with them. And so Mary's kind of with this group, and they're grieving with her as she's grieving the loss of her brother. And, and Martha pulls her aside and says, hey, Jesus is in the village. And so Mary goes, okay, I'm going to get up and I'm going to go see him. And so she's leaving. They're all trying to kind of mourn with her. And, and Mary's leaving. And so they're like, oh, where's she going? Oh, let's follow her. Maybe she's going to go mourn at the tomb. And so they follow her. What's interesting is they didn't follow Martha. They followed Mary. And as we get into Mary's interactions with Jesus, it's a little different. Verse 32. Now, when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been there, my brother would not have died. Now, if you remember the story from last week, Martha said the same thing. She said, Lord, if you'd have been here, he wouldn't have died. You think that they had kind of had that conversation ahead of time? What, what I don't think we realize is, because it's not in the story, but it's the obvious elements that are there. They sent messengers to Jesus at the beginning of chapter 11. Jesus got a message in verse 3. So the sisters sent to him saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. So there's these messengers that reach Jesus and they say, hey, Lazarus, he's not well. It's, it's bad. You need to come. And Jesus looks at the messengers and says, okay, but not right now. So the messengers are like, okay, we're going to get it back on our horses or our donkeys or we're going to you know, run, hightail it back. They get back to Mary and Martha. It's not in the text, but it's obvious. And they say, hey, we told Jesus. We found him. And they're like, great, where's he at? Oh, he's, he's not coming. What do you mean he's not coming? Lazarus is sick. He's, he's not coming. And, and they had to deal with that, the fact that he's not coming. And Lazarus had probably just was right on the, on, on, right on the dress door, if not dead. And he, he's not coming? What do you mean he's not coming? Lord, if you would have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. That's some pretty intense emotion. Mary comes to Jesus, and in verse 32, she fell at his feet. That's in grief. Have you ever been that sad? Where it's hard to get up? It's interesting, Martha comes to Jesus, and when she comes to Jesus, she's kinda, she, she says the same thing, if you weren't here, but 
she's able to have a kind of a theological conversation with Jesus. You know, yeah, I know he's going to be rising again in the last days. I mean, she's clearly sad, but, but we know from maybe other stories, she's a little bit more of a doer. I think when she, she handles grief by getting stuff done, <laughs> right? And so she's probably making all the preparations and making sure they had food for the mourners and making sure all the mourners are all set up. And, and Mary's just as strong. And those, are, those are two different kinds of people and how they handle grief. Let's not judge that. But, but Mary comes to Jesus and she just falls at his feet. I, I just envision her just weeping. And that's what we see in verse 33. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping. So, so they're just... There's all this wailing and crying, and she just falls at Jesus' feet and says, if you were here, almost as if to say, why weren't you here? And Dana did a great job last week talking about how sometimes God doesn't move on our timetable. He doesn't work to our schedule. And sometimes what makes the most logical sense to us in the world is not how God intends things to go. And God uses grief. I haven't looked at my notes yet, so give me a second. Verse 33 is a hard verse. I'm going to tell you why. Verse 33, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. Now, if you have a different translation, all of them are going to say fairly the same thing. It's actually pretty consistent. Uh, The NASB, I think, says deeply troubled. NIV, deeply troubled. This word in the Greek means kind of angry, not sad. In fact, the, the word in the Greek actually literally means like it, a, a snort of a horse, like <sighs> that irritation. And I don't say that to dismiss what's going on here. I say that because that's what it says. Now, I I don't want to speculate about what Jesus was thinking. And, and, And I think we have a tendency to judge people when we see them act or respond in a certain way, and we're like, oh, well, why would you respond that way? We don't know. So I what I'm about to give you is a speculation. Okay? It doesn't say it in the text, but it says he was angry. Says he was indignant. He's frustrated. He's possibly mad that people didn't believe him. He told the disciples, This will not end in death. Right? He's sick, but it's not going to end in death. This is for God's glory. The disciples are in the room. We don't, we don't see them really actually in any of the rest of the text. We see Mary, we see Martha, then we see everybody, kind of like just blown away. But we don't see the disciples specifically mentioned, but they've got to be with Jesus. And so Mary's there, crying, weeping, and Jesus is like, I've told you this is not going to end in death. He just got done talking to Martha, told her that I have the ability to resurrect. Do you not believe who I am? And furthermore, you're, you're saying, well, if you were here, this wouldn't have been a problem. But now that you're here, you can do nothing. Maybe that's what he was frustrated by. You just still don't get it. He was deeply moved in his spirit, greatly troubled. That's, the troubled is, is one word, and the moved in his spirit is another. Verse 34, he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Verse 35, Jesus wept. This is not the wailing and the moaning that you see going on in the other verses. This is the stone-faced tears just falling down your face because you don't know how else to respond. Greek word's pretty specific about it. Jesus is just crying. Not sobbing and lots of noise, but just crying. Sad. In his humanity, he weeps for Lazarus and all of mankind. 
and in his divinity, he would raise him from the grave. It's very interesting as, as I want to stop, and I, and I appreciate that when verse divisions were put into the Bible in like the 16th century, uh, 15th, 16th century, they intentionally gave this one verse, which then means that if you're a kid this morning and your parents tell you to memorize scripture, you can go home and say Jesus wept and you just got your verse done for the day, right? But there's so much packed into that verse. It's interesting is that this was actually an important verse um, in history. Um, but even more so, it's important because it gives us a glimpse in what Jesus is like. Hebrews chapter 1. If you want to turn there, you can. You don't have to. But Hebrews chapter 1. And I'm going to go to verse 1. Hebrews 1.1. 1, 1. I'm just going to read three verses. I actually want to read to the first part of the third verse. Writer of Hebrews, we're not exactly sure who it is. Some say it's Paul, uh, recorded by Luke. Um, long ago, verse 1, in many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God in the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. What, what I want to key in there, it says that Jesus is the exact imprint of God the Father's nature. And, and 1 John talks about how he's, he's the visible God. You want to know what God looks like? You want to know what he seems like? You want to know how God responds? Look to Jesus. That's right. Go back to John. A little bit of heresy to, for those of you who like the kind of the history and the theology stuff. I know some of you are like, oh, skip over that stuff. But some of you are like, oh, I just want that nugget. Here, here's a nugget. So there's a word for the day. is doceticism. Doceticism. Um, that is the belief that physical is bad. Everything physical is bad. There's a Greek tradition it started seeping its way into the church into the second and third century. And um, they basically taught these heretics, they're not Christians, uh, they taught that Jesus did not have a physical body, he had a celestial body, and that the suffering that Jesus experienced was apparent suffering. His death was an apparent death, but he didn't actually die because he didn't have any physical body. So when they took the nail and struck it through, it looked like it went through, but really he's not physical, so it doesn't matter. Yeah, it's a weird, weird kind of belief system, but it was because everything physical was bad. They believed that everything spiritual was good and everything physical was bad. And the funny part is, is that continues to this day, where we have a little bit of kind of a mentality that if it's physical, it must be bad, and there's something so much greater for the spiritual. It actually comes from that, and it's kind of permeated, and it's kind of separated itself out in different ways. So um, this is a great verse. Jesus wept. He actually cried tears. Um, you have to have a physical body to do that. So not coughing for that one. So Jesus cries. He weeps. Verse 36. The Jews ascribed motive to Jesus' weeping. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? What's interesting is, is that the Jews knew he opened the eyes of the blind man. Nobody, nobody questioned that, right? We talked about that last time I was preaching, as I happened to do John 9. No one's questioning that this guy's eyes were opened. And they recognized how big of a deal that was. And they go, well, if he did that, he could have easily kept this guy from dying. He must not have really loved him. Maybe that's why Jesus wept. Don't do this. Don't think you can know another person's motives. Don't ascribe motive to somebody. Maybe he did love him. Maybe that's why he did what he did. 
Verse 38. And then Jesus deeply moved again. That's the same word. Frustrated. Angry. <sighs> Hard to do with a mask. I found some of my glasses and everything. Came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was laid against it. Verse 39. Jesus said, Take away the stone. And Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. I like the King James Version. Does anyone have the King James Version this morning? Yeah, what does it say? He stinketh. He stinketh. (laughs) Yeah, does he stinketh. Right? So, uh, I'm going to get a little graphic, not too graphic, a little graphic. Um, Four days. Jewish people, first off, very interesting tradition. Uh, the Jewish people actually believed that the spirit of the person would hover over the body for about three days. And so they, they believed that when the person died, that they may recover within the three-day period. And so how they would act, they would just make sure that, you know, we kind of keep an eye on everything. In fact, they actually would even post a guard of the body who would just make sure. Uh, some degree, they didn't have a way of checking vitals in the same way that we do. Um, and if you have your pulse is particularly faint, you might not know. Um, so they would just kind of keep someone there to keep an eye on it. And they truly believed the spirit would just hover over the body for a couple of days. But by the fourth day, your organs deteriorate. That's the smell. They rot out. And it gets graphic. At that point, there ain't coming back. Because even if, even if somehow you woke up, your body is not going to work. Four days, Mary says, that's too long. And what's interesting is every resurrection that Jesus has performed up to this point has been almost immediately after the person died. So you could argue, well, he just did CPR. <laughs> he just brought him back. They were, they were a little bit out. Spirit was hanging over the body. He brought him up. No big deal. That's why the blind man was such a big deal. You think, oh, but didn't he raise this, girl's da- this guy's daughter? And didn't he raise this centurion? Yeah, but I mean, people got up when they thought they were dead before. Blind men, born blind, don't see. People dead in the grave four days don't get up. Lord, there will be an odor, for he's been dead for four days. Verse 40, Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? That's a question of, you said you believed. If you were to go back to verse Verse 27, yes, Lord, I believe you, that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who's coming to this world. And he said, didn't I tell you, do you not believe? And for me, application there, a lot of times he tells me things and I don't believe them. A lot of times I'll read something in Scripture and it says, God intends this for your good. And I go, not this. (laughs) Not this. Verse 41. So they took away the stone. They listened to him. All right, fine, have it your way. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said audibly. I wish it, I wish it said it there. <laughs> it's just that you know, this isn't like him saying this in his head and, you know, some sort of silent prayer like we do. Jesus is audibly going to say these words. Father, I thank you that you have heard me, and I know that you always hear me, but I say this on the account of the people standing around that they may believe that you sent me. He's making a claim. You sent me, and you always listen to me. And you sent me for a very specific purpose, and I want all of these people to get it. And they heard that. 
In verse 43, when he has said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. Now, I've heard, I've heard preachers say, well, you know, if he didn't name Lazarus, they all would have came out. No, I think Jesus is, is pretty capable of clearly, you know, using his power how he intends. Okay. <laughs> but, but point valid, right? If he wanted to bring them all out, he could have. Um, you know, dry bones back to life kind of thing like we see. Lazarus come out, and the man who had died, the man who had died, he was dead. There was no question. He came out, his hands and his feet bound with linen straps, and his face wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. They don't talk about much what happened after that. But I bet there was a whole lot of hooting and hollering. <laughs> Well, that's it. Like, we don't die anymore. He really is the resurrection and the life. He really does have that kind of power. And guess what? He can not only heal blind men, word blind, he can bring people who are gone, gone back. If we would believe that this morning. Verse 45, we're going to go through the next section. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and seen what he did, believed in him. What was the action? Uh, we, you did it. He prayed. He prayed the prayer. He asked the Father and said, show them. And he raised someone from the dead. They believed him. Verse 46, but some, <laughs> but some. But some went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. And then the Pharisees went, wow, he must be from God. We should just believe whatever he says. No. Verse 47, so the chiefs, priests, and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, what are we to do for this man performs many signs? I mean, you can go check on Lazarus. He's, he's, still, he's alive. What are we going to do about this? He's performing signs. Verse 48, if we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come take away both our place and our nation. There's their motivation. Well, we'll lose the whole, like, council and, you know, our city and the way things are, and we'll lose all that tradition if we keep letting him preach and bring people back from the dead. But one of them, Caiaphas, verse 49, who was the high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole, man, whole nation should perish. Oh, what an interesting statement, Caiaphas. John records the next verse. Verse 51, he did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nations. So whether it's at this time or a previous time, Caiaphas had said, I got a word from the Lord. Jesus is going to die for the nations. And he's like, see, this is the prophecy coming true. We kill him and our nation's fine. Verse 52, and not for that nation only, but also to gather into the children of God who are scattered abroad. He must have forgot that part. That's us. Verse 53, so from on that day, they made plans to put him to death. This is when it changes. This is when that hour that we've been talking about for so long comes. Jesus, therefore, no longer walked openly among the Jews, but went from there to the regions near the wilderness to a town called Ephraim, where he stayed with the disciples. I'm going to pause it there. I want to show you one more thing. Let's move forward a little bit. Chapter 12, verse 9. When a large crowd of Jews learned that Jesus was coming, so he came to an area, was there, they came not only on account of him, but also to see who? 
He's still around, man. He's kicking. I bet, I bet he has a lot to say. <laughs> Whom had risen from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to put who to the death? Yeah, if we can't deny the sign, let's just kill the guy he raised back from the dead. Like, that's going to work. Lazarus has got a big target on his forehead now, too. It's like, okay, we're going to put Jesus to death, and then we got... I mean, we've got to put Lazarus to death. We've got to call this, he raised a dead person. Because that's never been done. If we would believe that Jesus is the resurrection and the life, how would that change how we view our life? This isn't it. This isn't it. And if you think this is it, I am sorry. Because it's not that great. (laughs) Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. I come to bring life. Believe in me, and it will be so. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for coming and for experiencing humanity as a human, experiencing grief and frustration, tiredness and weakness, and ultimately experiencing suffering so that that way we might be able to experience life. Father, I pray that this morning that as we look to this next week, as we look to our lives, Pray that we would be reminded of the resurrection that is to come, the promise that he is the resurrection of life and that this isn't it. Pray that that would be on our minds this week. We ask these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Can you hear me? <clears throat> Would you join us for one last song?
for this time that we've had together and Father we pray that the worship that has gone forth would be a pleasing sacrifice in your ears and your nostrils Father we pray that the word that has been shared would go deep and Father would bear 30, 60 and 100 fold return for your kingdom go forth before us, Lord, help us to have a wonderful rest of the week, and it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Have a wonderful day, folks. Thank you.